Uh, so we're reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, great to be uh, here with you. Uh, great to be here uh, with you because it, uh, it confirms that your building project has begun, and that's, that's great. That's a uh, really, really encouraging experience. has taught me from uh, two building projects at uh, Bellevue is you can expect two things. Uh, you can expect the blessing of God, and you can expect the attack of the evil one. Uh, and the lessons I think we learned at Bellevue was we looked for the first one, and we didn't look for the second one. So I would encourage you to certainly look for the first one. God will bless your endeavors, but nothing annoys the evil one more than the idea of churches expanding and growing, and uh, I feel pretty confident he'll find a way to stir things up. He's out there on the prowl. So, uh, we'll continue to pray for you and look forward to um, sharing in your new building. G.K. Chesterton, who uh, wrote, you might know, the Father Brown uh, Mysteries, he's a wonderful Christian theologian. He's uh, long dead now, but he said this, that Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. Now, it's probably not accurate simply to lift that and apply it to uh, you and me as disciples, but it seems the case that the promise made that in this world you will have trouble, I think to a greater or lesser extent comes true 
for all of us. And it's not, if we're honest, one of the Lord's more popular teachings for us. The trouble is, as you folks have been reflecting over the past few weeks, our lives are often defined by trouble or troubles of one sort or another. Some folks going through inexplicable, it seems to us, suffering and heartache and difficulty in their lives. Some folks simply overwhelmed by, by life and its worries and its stresses and Goodness me, there's lots of that around these days. And I know you've looked at the, the dreadful despair of, of depression, that clinical condition that seems to afflict some people from time to time. And maybe for the rest of us, we suffer from what John Stott described as the chief occupational hazard of the Christian discouragement. <laughs> you simply get fed up sometimes, don't you? Life just doesn't go the way you want it to go. Your Christian faith seems to stumble along and isn't what you really want it to be. Well, this morning, as you work through your series, it starts to require of us a slightly different mindset as we begin to consider how we work these things out in the context of our faith in a good God whose desire is always and only for our good. Now, as Andrew said, I'm charged with trying to answer a question for you. How can we build ourselves up, and how can we build each other up? Now, you've been kind enough to give me the whole Bible <laughs> to choose from, which is sometimes not all that helpful. You don't quite know where to go, but but I felt led to go to 2 Corinthians 4, and if you follow along with the Encounter with God Scripture Union notes, you're ahead of the game because you'll have been reading 2 Corinthians, and indeed you'll have read chapter 4 uh, last week, unless of course you're behind and you've got it to look forward to, and God bless you if that's happening. 2 Corinthians is Paul's most personal of letters. He, he's writing it in the context of personal opposition, of a real anxiety and a deep concern for these wayward Christians in Corinth. He's had several goes at writing to them, and they're a, they're a difficulty to him. But at the heart of this chapter is a, is a rather uncomfortable biblical truth that we all need to grasp if we are ever to make anything of the, the difficulties in our lives as human beings and as Christians. That all these issues and these pains and these thorns and these worries that we desperately want sorted and that we continually pray, God, will you take them away? They're not accidental. They're not the luck of the creatorial draw which defines some people to, to suffer from depression and others to have heartache in their life. Nor is it because, as some folks still suggest, that, well, they're just not living right and they need to get more engaged with their Bibles and that'll sort everything out. No, Paul has a very telling picture for us here right in the middle of this chapter. He says in verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Now, each home had these jars. They were ordinary. They were ubiquitous. Uh, they were fragile. They were rather plain, unattractive. Many of them cracked. They were dispensable. If you dropped them, they shattered into pieces. But it didn't matter. They were two a penny. You went down to the market and bought another one. But they had a purpose. And they were invaluable to the home. You could use them to hold water. You could use them as lamps to light your way. And you could hide your valuables if you had any in them. And so it's so important, you see, that we need to grasp that this side of heaven, you and I are not fine bone china 
to be preserved and polished and admired, nor are we intended to be strong, indestructible, bulletproof people. We're jars of clay. Some of us so fragile. Some of us prone to failure and to cracking. Others so ordinary we feel sure that no one even notices us or thinks we even matter. But we have a purpose and we have a value because in God's service what counts is not the container but the content. Now, Paul's not being theoretical here. He knew what being a jar of clay looked and felt like. He tells us in verses 8 and 9, afflicted, crushed, persecuted, struck down. In chapter 10, he, he, he writes there of what people are, are saying about him. You know, they're saying about Paul, well, you know, he can write a good letter, but don't invite him to speak because he doesn't look very good and he's not much use as a speaker. Paul admitted that in chapter 11 of this book. He says, I, I'm not the best speaker around. And of course, as if all that wasn't bad enough, he tells us in chapter 11 of what it felt like to be an apostle. In reality, the number of times he was beaten and whipped, the dangers he was exposed to his near-death experiences. That's my calling, he says, as a clay jar. And then, of course, in chapter 7, he, he talks of this thorn in the flesh, and wouldn't we love to know what that was? But he doesn't tell us. But it's harassed him, and he's prayed about it three times. And all God has said to him is, you're keeping your thorn because my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And I think it's that truth that enables Paul to say twice in our chapter, we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. Now, as I thought about how on earth I was going to discharge my brief this morning, there are, of course, numerous scriptures we could have gone to that would give us really good advice about how to build ourselves up and others. You know, read your Bible, pray every day, come to church, have fellowship, go to your home groups. It's not rocket science. But I figured you'd know all that. And the reality is, of course, we know through our own experience that these activities, vital though they are to the Christian life, and testimony, they're not silver bullets to sorting out our problems, are they? Our lives don't instantly get better after our quiet time. They don't instantly get better because we've spent slightly longer in prayer this morning than we did on another morning. The problems often are still there. Oh, we might get a better perspective on them, but they're still there. And so it seems to me a better place to start as we try and answer the question is like Paul, actually to recognize our human frailty, but to see that in that frailty, God works to bring power and to bring blessing, not just to us, but through that frailty, verse 15, to more and more people as His grace extends and thanksgiving increases. So, I want us to find encouragement this morning as clay jars and hope that we'll see that being a clay jar is God's way of ensuring your life and ministry for Him is the best it could possibly be, and therefore you will build others up. Now, I'm really chuffed to tell you this morning I've got a sermon with three Ps. You have no idea how good it makes a speaker feel. <laughs> if you can get a sermon with three Ps. Here's the first one. The purpose of God's clay jars. 
they were, as I said, completely ubiquitous throughout society. Every home had a clay jar, and they all had a purpose. Uh, they weren't just useful, they were essential. If you wanted to get water from the well, you took your clay jar. If you wanted to light your way around your house, you put the wick in the clay jar. The clay was so thin you could see through it. And if you had valuables, and the Romans were good at this, they hid them in their clay jars, and people are still digging up clay jars with Roman coins in them, hence Paul's reference to treasure. So here's the purpose and reason why we are clay jars. Our lives, says Paul, are all about God. He says, verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now, that's, of course, very countercultural, isn't it? Even, I suggest, within our churches. You know, the world would define success not as a clay jar, but as an ornate vase, which would draw admiring glances that people would look at, that people would wish that they had won, because our world places very little value on ordinary clay jars. And I think sometimes, even as Christians, we can think that way too. You know, your church has to be big. It's got to be popular. Your leaders have to be charismatic and gifted. That's what churches need, right? Or that the only Christians that ever achieve anything from God are the strong Christians, the gifted Christians, the intelligent ones. Listen, says Paul, God's design is that we are clay jars so that it is His power that's seen. And notice it's not a power that just compensates for our frailty. It's not that God recognizes we're hopeless clay jars, so, so gives us a wee bit just to make us feel better. No, no, says Paul. He provides to get this each clay jar an abundance. This His surpassing power. The word is hyperbole. We know what that means. It's that notion of excess, almost to the point of being a waste. God is not stingy in delivering His power to us. It's there in surpassing amounts. So here's my first encouragement to you, my fellow clay jars. You may not be confident. You may not be gifted. You may not be even talented. You may not feel particularly inspired. You may be terribly shy, feeling weak, beaten up, perplexed about all of this gospel. You may be uncertain about things, but listen, God's all-surpassing power is at work even through you, and it's His power, not your power, that makes the difference. And after all, what would you rather be, a beautiful but empty vase? or a clay jar with a priceless treasure. The purpose of God's clay jars. Here's the second one, the paradox of God's clay jars. Paul takes this picture and he deepens it by reminding us that the very fact that being a clay jar confirms the great paradox that sits at the heart of the Christian gospel, that all this all-surpassing power is made perfect in weakness. Now, if you were to ask Paul what it felt like to be a clay jar, he would have said it feels like death. Not death warmed up. You know, sometimes you feel miserable. I feel like death warmed up. No, it just feels like death, he says in verses 10 to 12. I'm always carrying in my body the death of Jesus we who live are always being given over to the death for Jesus. It's not just that occasionally life got a bit tough for Paul. That's his abiding status. 
We always carry, he says, we're always being given over. And if you were to dig around a bit in Acts, you'd find many examples of that. There in Acts 14, in Lystra, Paul upsets them and they, they stone him to the point he, he, he's totally unconscious and they drag him out of the city and dump him there. Given up for dead, they think they've done the job. And the other disciples find him. I don't know, get him up on his feet, dust him down, whatever medical care was in these days. And what does Paul do? Straight back into Lystra. Amazing. You see, the whole basis of the Christian gospel is built on this paradox. The cross, the way of weakness and death. And yet it was the only way by which God's power could be shown to the world, to your heart and to mine. Through his death came life. And it's to that pattern we're called. If we use the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. He doesn't call him to bid him come and decorate the world. He bids him come and die. Now, I don't think we really want that. Of course, I'm not sure I want that. We want life. We want victory. We want success. And if we're honest, of course, we would add all the things that the world says, actually, you should be chasing after your health, your wealth, your popularity, your pain-free, joy-filled, happy as a cloud-type existence. Now, as Christians, of course, we accept what Jesus told the crowd one day, if you want to be my follower, then you turn from your selfish ways, you take up your cross, and you follow me. Now, those who heard Jesus that day only thought one thing, that, that if you took up your cross, it meant the Romans were going to crucify you. You were dead. Now, that kind of extreme, of course, is unlikely to be our literal destiny, although for many in the wider Christian church across the world, of course, that's exactly the destiny they risk. We often, of course, equate the niggles of our lives as, you know, such as a cross I've got to bear as we limp our way through life. Well, that's not right either. But the truth is that for you and I as clay jars, the fact that we are given over to death, the hallmarks of that earthly existence are the marks of faithful Christian testimony. Did you notice in verses 10 and 11 the little phrase, so that? We're given over to death so that, says Paul, life is revealed. The life we are asked to live by God is a purposeful life, a life that is empowered by Him. So, my fellow clay jar, if you're wondering why this morning your life's not what you want it to be, and there are lots of things you would cheerfully wish God could get rid of for you, if there are these pains and these perplexities and issues, well, here's the encouragement. The life of Jesus is being shown. And verse 15 there is the, the greatest promise, isn't it, and motivation to keep going. It says, Paul, to these Corinthians, it's all for your sake, so that as grace extends more to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. We sang some wonderful hymns this morning. They pointed out the second command of the Lord to love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe an aspect of that love for your neighbor is actually your life is really uncomfortable and painful and difficult, and his isn't. And he looks at you, and despite your pain, despite your difficulty, you're still smiling, and you still want to talk about Jesus. The all-surpassing power is revealed. It's a paradox. But we need to welcome the truth that weakness, you see, and ministry go hand in hand. And we need to resolve with God's help that, you know, in our weakness, we may well get knocked down. And it will never be knocked out. The paradox of God's clay jar. Here's the third one. The perspective of God's clay jar. Because there's a perspective which all clay jars need to have, you and I need to have, if we're going to be comfortable 
as being a rather weak and unimpressive container for the gospel. And the perspective is that simply of eternity. Paul says in verse 14, He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into His presence. You see, whatever happens, we will, like Jesus, be resurrected. If there's one Christian doctrine we undersell, keeping it for a a once-a-year festival, it's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should talk about that every single week. Because it is only by seeing that that we'll find that the old clay jar actually becomes, verse 17, something that's beyond all comparison. It's only by viewing life from that perspective that you can find meaning and purpose in what Paul describes for his own experiences, well, light and momentary afflictions. I'm not sure being stoned to death is a light and momentary affliction, but, you know, Paul's perspective on it. Let me just pick out a couple of things here that are important. Verse 16, Paul makes the obvious point that, you know, outwardly, we're not making any progress. Come maybe as a surprise to some of you, but you're wasting away. We know that. The Greek word is the same word they use for perishable goods. The next time the milk goes off in the fridge, a wee lesson to remind you you're wasting away. But wonderfully, each and every day, God's resurrection power is at work. Renewal is happening. Day by day, God gives us a fresh supply of His grace. Do you remember in the desert, He gave them the manna each day. They had to truck out there and pick it each day, except the Sabbath. God doesn't give you a big dollop of grace on a Sunday and you hope that lasts you through the week. You've got to do it day by day. That's how it works. That's how it works. And that's why reading your Bible every day and praying every day is so important. That's how renewal happens. It's how the resurrection becomes real in your life day by day. Now, you may glimpse it only occasionally, of course. You need to grasp it by faith, by hope, which Paul would tell the Ephesians, you've got the Holy Spirit as your guarantee until you take possession of your full inheritance. The big question for us, of course, is can we be satisfied with inward renewal or are we too obsessed still with preventing or halting or asking God to sort out the external outward wasting away? Second point is very practical. What is it that we look at or to Is it simply the things we see? So often it is, isn't it? And we look at our own weaknesses. But occasionally we look at other people's. I'm glad I'm not them. And that's all we see. Weaknesses, the fragility, the the clayness, says Paul. Uh, Look at the things you can't see. A phrase which, of course, makes no sense to the world. You know, stop finding flaws in the jar, your own jar or someone else's, and start rejoicing in and revealing the treasure they contain. And so the perspective of the clay jar is simply one which is based not on the now, but on the then, and knowing that there is an eternal weight of glory that's beyond comparison, that should help us. It should make our troubles now light and momentary. I'm still not sure I've dealt with the question properly, but let me give you three suggestions that maybe will help you in your life and maybe help you to help others. The first one is this. I think we, uh, we need to learn the value of clay jars because we are all clay jars. Now, however that clay manifests itself in your life, God's purpose is always and only to show His power through your life. You may feel that you have little value for a whole range of reasons, and yet your life is so that Christ's life 
is shown. Learn your value. Secondly, what really counts is not the container, but what it contains. We have this treasure, says Paul. Each of us as Christians have something beyond measure. And the incredible fact is that the weaker the vessel, the more likely it is you will see what's inside. I tried hard, you know, to find some real-life examples of, of, of this kind of thing that weren't kind of lifted from Scripture. The only one that, that I could really latch on was dear Joni er er Erickson Tara, you know, that, that girl that found herself crippled as a teenager but went on to live a life of such blessing in a body that was, you know, beyond useless. And I, I tried to think of other ones, and then, of course, it occurred to me, clay jars are inherently unremarkable. That's why we don't remember them. What counts? It's, it's the message, verse 6, the light that shines out of the darkness. And then thirdly, we really need to grasp with everything we have the eternal perspective of life. You know, so much of what we struggle with is magnified because we fail to recognize that, well, God's future is settled and, and by comparison is beyond our imagination. Now, the truth is that that only really becomes a reality when we get to the end of ourselves and our own power. But really, for so many of us, we, we never really want to get there. There must be something I can do. There must be something somebody else can do. Life will be better next week when this is sorted or that is sorted. Actually, perhaps not. Perhaps for what you have now, God is revealing His glory in ways you can't even begin to imagine. Grasp the eternal perspective. As I said, I have no idea if I've given you enough to encourage you. Maybe not. Some of you maybe didn't want to come and be told you're a clay jar, you thought you've got dressed up in your finery this morning. And... But there is something utterly splendid, isn't there? about the ordinariness of humanity that it might display the extraordinariness of the treasure that is the Christian gospel. May God bless you and bless all of us as we seek to show His surpassing power. Let's seek His blessing in prayer as we close. Let's pray. Father God, uh, You made each of us uniquely and in Your image. Uh, we'd like so much, so often, to kind of tweak things, uh, change things, make things better as far as we can tell. Now, your purpose for us is clear. You want us to show your power and not our own. And therefore, Father, give us a comfort in our ordinariness that we may display your extraordinariness. And help us always, always to bear in mind that the death we show in our bodies now is so that the life of Christ might be shown. That your glory would extend and that many, many more would give thanks to you for who you are and what you have done. We pray for your spirit as he works in our hearts this week. Encourage us, bless us, convict us, and be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.